Okay. Okay. Uh, welcome, everybody, to this uh, lecture in uh, in international logistics. Uh, from your uh, proposals for your for your uh, assignment, I can see that uh, quite some of you would, will have uh, to make use of some of the. Uh, some of the material from uh, from this uh, this topic, international logistics. Uh, this is not. Uh, I mean, I don't think it's planned like this. This picture, and uh, it's an Italian ship. And those who you have followed Italian politics for the last few days may have. I see some similarities here. Um, they are struggling a bit at the moment. Um, <coughs> what we're going to talk about here is uh, we're going to uh, going to talk a bit about challenges that uh, internationalization presents to <coughs> to logistics management and supply chain management, and um, and also to to. Uh, to, to shed light on some of the characteristics on the <coughs> global logistics network. So the, the, the objective with this is to give an overview of tendencies and uh, to shed light on some, on some challenges, like for instance uh, addressing risk in international supply chain uh, or logistics uh, networks. And also <coughs> to to say a little bit about what factors are you do you have to consider when you're going to set up uh, or design uh, for international logistics. So this is uh, the the point of departure for for this lecture. I have um, uh, uploaded uh, chapter four in Harrison and Van Hoek a textbook. Which is placed on uh, on this uh, on the documents in in fronter, so you can have that as a supplementary reading to to this uh, this lecture. There are different forms of internationalization, uh, depending on uh, let's say the level of ambition. Uh, the and to what extent it is, it is productive to, to enter into to different types of internationalization. It's not, a, let's say, a, a, a ranking list where the totally integrated global, global supply chains is what we are aiming at. That's not true. Uh, because you can, you can choose from this uh, list, enter into collaboration, uh, coordination when it comes to international distribution systems. Uh, one could address the need for international suppliers if you're going to, to, uh, to uh, produce something that needs input from, uh, from uh, players in other countries. Uh, like, for instance, this region here produces quite a lot of um, electromechanical equipment that is purchased by uh, producers in other countries. We are, uh, we are here uh, delivering or supplying quite a lot of such equipment to Brazil, for instance. Um, for shipbuilding building of, uh, of offshore supply vessels. And do you know why? And now I'm talking about Brazil as a specific case. Because why, one could ask why not build the, the ships from, uh, from Kiel to, to, to Mast in Norway instead of exporting a lot of equipment. That has to do with politics, regulations, which needs to be addressed. They cannot, 
uh, we, um, such vessels have to be built in Brazil. I mean, they couldn't say that if they had been a member of the European Union, but they are not, and, and they, can, uh, they can set their own conditions. And they have decided that uh, ships that are going to be used on the Brazilian continental shelf should be built in Brazil. But they, <coughs> they have needed uh, equipment and also, uh, also concepts for, uh, for ship design, which are bought from here. Uh, production abroad is a, is a third category. Uh, we talked a bit about that last time. Uh, and also about some emerging trends that some companies are, uh, are reversing that process and taking, uh, and taking the, the production uh, back home again, onshoring or homeshoring. Uh, but that has to do with, with uh, as we shall see later on, it has to do with production and the factor prices in, the, in, the, in other countries. And there are some issues that needs to be addressed to, to, make, uh, to make the best decisions and we are going to talk a bit more about that later on. And then the totally integrated global supply chains, which sounds nice, but it is very, very complicated. And uh, such supply chains, one example is, uh, is a company that is also located here in, uh, in this region called Rolls-Royce. Heard about them, all of you, I, I, I suppose. They are producing uh, quite a lot of uh, different products with a lot of production sites uh, located uh, worldwide. And they, they combine uh, sourcing and production in many, in many places. Like uh, here locally, they produce um, a lot of electronics equipment and also more heavier, uh, heavier mechanical equipment, which then can be used in, uh, in assembly processes in other parts of the world. <coughs> um, such global supply chains, they may become too big, too complex, and, and, uh, and the governance issues may, may become a, a severe challenge for, for many companies. They lose, I won't say that they lose control, but th things tend to, to develop perhaps without a very strict planning process and a very strict uh, decision-making process. Uh, at the outset, and hence it may start to grow in a bit uh, in a bit organic way without perhaps uh, very careful and detailed assessment processes uh, up front before the decisions are made. So Rolls Royce has indicated that perhaps one should take a look at their own uh, conglomerate of businesses and see whether it is a case for, uh, for streamlining some of this. Um, <coughs> then, the drivers. Uh, if you are in the shoes of a company, you would, uh, you would like to check out, uh, start with the, the factor prices, costs of supplies, uh, land use costs, labor costs, housing, rents and materials. That is one reason. Um, and then you have the trade-off between factor prices and, for instance, uh, forecasted development in, the, in, these, uh, in these factor prices and risks quality risks, supply risks, and things like that, which we'll, I'll talk a bit about that later. The second one is a need to follow customers internationally in order to supply locally and, and, and fast. 
that means I, I mentioned the car industry on the la last lecture, where some players, car makers, has almost they have by means of contracts forced the suppliers to locate very, very close to them to, to reduce lead time. So so that is uh, that is one uh, one. Uh, one reason for uh, for uh, for going going international, uh, a search for new markets. Um, one example of that is when the German and uh, one German and one French car maker they s set up businesses in uh, or or production plants in in uh, in uh, China. To, to penetrate uh, markets there. Um, a side point there is that uh, they produce the yesterday's models as new cars to be sold in, in, uh, in, in, in that market. And by doing that, they can exploit economies of scale in, in the in production of cars because it costs a lot to, to develop a new uh, a new uh, model and when the when the market is sort of emptied in in Europe and elsewhere uh, some of them have tried to lengthen the lifespan of the model by setting up production plants in other countries that has happened in Africa and it has happened in in, in China um, Japanese car makers, Toyota, Honda, have set up factories in, in Europe to, to penetrate the European market and to, to avoid uh, customs and, uh, and, uh, and charges, import charges into Europe by producing in Europe. Uh, they, they avoid such uh, taxes and custom fees and things like that. This, uh, <coughs> this is an important uh, issue to, to, to learn from existing companies in other parts of the world, um, like uh, has been done here locally, where uh, Rolls-Royce and others has bought themselves into local uh, local businesses taken over local businesses and the the idea is to to uh, to learn from good uh, let's say good and leading companies in 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 other parts of the world <coughs> so this is a, this is a dynamic picture there may be combinations of course here but these four are main reasons and main drivers for going uh, going uh, into other other countries. Um, <coughs> we're going to talk about uh, centralized inventories and manufacturing, um, which. Um, has to do with uh, with uh, exploiting economies of scale, economies of scope. Um, another focus is to to address time to the market. There may be a contradiction between going global and reduce lead time for obvious reasons, transport distances the number of uh, consolidation points underway, and so on. Uh, <coughs> a global consolidation means, uh, means uh, trying to merge related activities into one or several bigger plants or warehouses or distribution centers for that sake. So we see some 
some uh, some uh, characteristics here which has been ta uh, going on for some years uh, these these two uh, trends which I also talked a bit about when we dealt with international trade that um, uh, the reason for these movements has to do with uh, has to do with uh, with the search for uh, for reduced costs and reduced factor prices. So offshoring from the United States to Mexico, from Western Europe to Eastern Europe, there is a, a emerging car industry in the, in uh, in the Eastern European countries, and also in uh, in Turkey. Turkey is a is a very interesting part of Europe, divided between Europe and Asia. Uh, because they, uh, they are, we, we, hear, we hear a lot about uh, human rights issues and political issues. But Turkey is a very strong growing economy, actually. And you know <coughs> that they have also uh, entered into some uh, process uh, to join the um, European Union, which is interesting. Interesting for many reasons. Uh, <coughs> concentration at specific sites. Um, the obvious reason for concentration may be outtake of national resources. But also to exploit the benefits of an industry cluster. Being a part <coughs> of, a, of a successful industry cluster normally uh, entails improved, uh, an improved competitive power. Industry clusters are not a phenomenon that you can expect to, to emerge overnight. Some of them are, uh, are, uh, are quite old, have a long culture for collaboration. An industry cluster consists of uh, some main big companies, their suppliers, their customers, public sector agencies like education or, uh, or, uh, or uh, planning uh, agencies or funding agencies like research and development funding. An industry cluster <coughs> also consists of uh, demanding customers and demanding customers is not a negative thing here because many industry clusters have been built upon demand from a specific sector the shipbuilding industry here they started out from uh, a demand for advanced fishing vessels and then the oil and gas industry came along created the need for specialized vessels which had some similarity with fishing vessels. They need to be good seagoing vessels and so on. So it has been a learning effect that has gone on for, uh, for, for decades in many of these uh, clusters. So they can be a combination of small and big industries, but they have something in common. And they are often also very closely linked socially. So if you see a bunch of, um, let's say, a bunch of companies located in the same area, they may not be a part of an industry cluster. Okay. <laughs> I think I should try to continue. Um, because they may be in fierce competition with, with each other. Within the cluster, the competition is, a, uh, and they may be in a fierce competition on equal or very homogeneous products. Whereas in an industry cluster, the, comp uh, the, the com um, competition takes place between variants of products. So you don't produce the same as your neighbor, but you produce a variant of what your neighbor is doing. And by that, 
it's easier, and I, I'm putting it a bit simple now, but it's easier to learn when you don't copy. I mean, learn in a co collaborative process. So that is one of the characteristics that separates industry, industrial clusters from others. And that's why uh, Rolls-Royce and, uh, and I don't know the name of the Italian uh, shipyard group that uh, bought STX, the STX yards here in this region. But they have understood that, that it's much easier to, to buy yourself into an existing cluster and try to sort of build up that knowledge uh, by creating something new uh, in terms of new clusters. And when you read about big industry parks in uh, various parts of the world, like for instance China, they are aiming at the same objective, namely to combine different activities in a way that you create these, these cluster mechanisms. Um, I can just show you what I'm <coughs> talking about here. If you are in a situation where you have invested quite a lot in, in product development, so you have invested a lot uh, of capital, maybe in, in, in buildings or in, uh, in uh, knowledge, you have trained people. You can say that <coughs> the average cost of one unit of production is then equal to the investment costs that you need to take before you start to produce something. And the variable costs of producing a unit divided by the number of units. So x is units and uh, this is the costs. So you see that if you have a high investment and you have not, and you have a, a much lower and, uh, and constant production cost per unit, which is a fair assumption. Because you, as long as you have excess capacity in production, uh, the unit cost can be assumed in most cases to be constant. So, as long as you have excess capacity, this will be the variable cost curve. Um, and as long as you have this situation and you have the high investment costs, the average cost curve will look something like this. So we are in a situation here where uh, there are what we call economies of scale. And that is what, it, when we talk about scale effects, this is the effect. We can introduce demand into this picture. And for this demand situation, and if you are in a situation where you have what we call monopolistic competition, that is, a competition among companies that produces variants or substitutes of the same product. You will have a, a market price like uh, this. Sorry. And you will have a market clearing quantity like this. So <coughs> when a new company enters, joins uh, a, a, an in industry cluster, they may uh, enter, they may then increase the demand for a certain type of supply. 
So, and when they establish themselves, when the size of the cluster grows, the demand can be expected to shift rightwards. And when that happens, you see the effect is a reduced commodity price. So when a new entrant enters into this, uh, this uh, existing cluster, or if an existing player expands their activity, factor prices can be expected to drop because of this cost structure. And I think this cost structure makes sense when we, when we talk about, I mean, almost every kind of production, but especially specialized production, high cost products in the relatively low volumes. You will have this. And you have an expand, expanded output, correspondingly, something like this. <coughs> and so we also see that we depart from the classical competitive equilibrium assumption that we have in microeconomics, where we set prices equal to marginal costs. Because if we set prices equal to marginal costs, that will not... Uh, <coughs> so the prices are related to those two points, whereas here, we have the price equal to marginal costs. And that one doesn't change here. So we don't get any effect if you, if you analyze uh, such um, shifts along the, the, the marginal cost. You don't get the price effects that you actually can observe empirically in, in certain markets. So when I'm talking about scale effects in, in, uh, in, uh, in clusters, that is mainly the theoretical workhorse of that reasoning. It's not, uh, I mean, it's not that old, uh, that, uh, let's say, that uh, kind of uh, approach. It was developed by a researcher called Paul Romer back in 1986. So it's some years ago, but not that many years ago because one struggled hard to understand why companies benefited from proximity, collaboration, but also competition on variants. That was an empirical observation, but, uh, but the theoretical understanding was, was a bit lacking. And, and uh, so that was a, a breakthrough in that understanding of, of, uh, of the mechanism behind industry clusters. But uh, underlying this simple illustration, there is a lot of mechanisms, of course, at work here, like trust, uh, which is a problem, which may be a problem if you, if you come as a foreigner and buys up one of the big players in the cluster. You may, have, you may get problems with trust, with information from your, uh, from your uh, uh, fellow companies in the area, and so on and so forth. So there are lots of challenges. Um, <coughs> the same illustration can be used when we talk about uh, the benefits of consolidation of cargo, putting larger volumes together to fill a ship or a truck or whatever. Because then you we'll talk more about that later on in the course, but. In transportation, you have much the same cost structure, especially if you talk about sea transport and also air transport. You need to invest in a vessel, it's expensive, big, but as long as the capacity is, uh, is okay, the, the marginal costs are rather low. So we have the average costs, which is what the 
uh, carrier needs to to uh, they need to take to charge these prices to avoid bankruptcy because if they charge lower than average cost they are not able to cover the capital costs and they may go bust but when volume increases that is when demand increases you increase volume and you reduce the, the price or the transport costs <coughs> so it's it's much the same um, mechanism at work and this is this is uh, this can be justified by using real numbers it's uh, it's uh, it's uh, easy to to see such patterns also in practice and that is that goes with the bulk and container transportation to uh, see cost advantages of consolidated transport but please note and i will remind you of this later on as well that if you consolidate and i mentioned that uh, previous week or the week before that if you consolidate <coughs> you will also impose increased lead time to your customers because it takes time to, to fill a ship. Remember the credit crunch uh, story uh, with, uh, with Chinese suppliers and so on. And time <coughs> is also part of the marginal costs here. So it's not, it's not, it's not sufficient just to calculate the marginal costs for the, ch for the, for the carrier or the marginal cost for the, for, the, for the warehouse or the distribution center. But to get, a, to get a, an equilibrium here or a solution, you also need to include the user's value of reduced lead time or value of increased lead time. If you don't do that, <coughs> you are uh, in... Uh, in risk of making the wrong decisions. And that goes without saying that, uh, that lead time may have a high value. Avoiding lead time may have a high value. Re refer to this Chinese supplier case during the credit crunch. Or it may have a low value. To some companies it doesn't matter whether the ship comes in today or next week for certain low value high volume commodities that may be perfectly in order and one should take advantage of such uh, differences when it sets up the transports uh, <coughs> decision making framework for international logistics this is taken from this uh, book chapter that i have uh, posted uh, to you um, it's divided into some useful categories, I think. Um, enablers, that is elements that can be uh, a necessary but not sufficient condition for, for, uh, for engaging into international logistics. You need to have the information flow in place. And you need to have a, a load carrier uh, and, a, and a way of, of shipping the goods that can be, uh, that can be feasible for, uh, for long distance, many uh, consolidation points to pass long distances and to pass many consolidation points. So the container, which I believe will be uh, the containerization of transport, which I believe will be a, a topic uh, next week when you are going to have maritime transportation if i remember correctly will be will be an issue that will be taken up there but containerization was a very important step for uh, for uh, achieving uh, a larger uh, degree of internationalization in uh, in uh, in in the world's logistics activities drivers we talked about these two 
showing you the economies of scale phenomenon. Big is in a way beautiful, but not always, because at some point in time you, you end up with, uh, with the scarcity of capacity, too long lead times, which is uh, interlinked with capacity. And, uh, and what happens then is that uh, you, uh, you, um, you have a, an increasing capacity cost curve or an uh, average cost curve. And you have a, an increasing marginal cost curve like this. And then you see that if a movement like along this curve will give a cost increase if you face uh, capacity problems in this market. Uh, the risks, we're going to talk a bit about them now. Um, there are risk factors that need to be addressed. Um, and uh, one obvious Risk is that uh, is breakdowns in the transportation network. Uh, you have also these kinds of uh, of issues. Uh, it's not trivial. I mean, and the big Norwegian uh, fertilizer manufacturer called Norsk Hydro, their plant was nationalized by some uh, Middle East authorities sometime during the 19, I think it was the late 1980s. Overnight, they didn't own their production plant anymore. It was taken over by the local authorities. It's a very drastic <coughs> uh, issue, of course, but there are some, some issues connected to that. Inventory and handling costs, um, that has to do with whether you are able to trace and to deal with uh, the, the intermediaries, the intermediary um, steps along the transportation chain. Because you are sort of putting your, your, uh, your commodities in, in the hands of a lot of players, normally along an international um, logistics uh, chain and you are not able to, to control, in many cases, the inventory and handling costs. But you can, of course, um, do that by buying services from a, from a third-party global logistics provider, and then you pay a cost for that, which is uh, higher than what you might uh, uh, expect or see if you, if you do that by dealing with a lot of players, you can buy yourself after that by, uh, by buying the services from a th third party logistics provider. And you, p you pay a kind of an insurance premium for that. So, uh, <coughs> so you, can, you can hedge against risk by taking uh, certain, uh, certain steps. And I'll talk a bit more, uh, more about that now. Because this is... Uh, this is a topic that, um, that has gained quite a lot of uh, attention in the research community uh, recently. Supply chain risk. Everybody has been uh, occupied with how to collaborate, how to share profits, how to share costs, how to share information, and so on. But uh, <coughs> there has not been very much attention against risk in the, in, the, in the supply chain. And that has been a, sort of put on the research agenda during the last, say, five to ten years or something like that. So, <coughs> even small, smaller happenings may, may have consequences uh, across, uh, actually across the global economic system. If a critical component is, uh, is running into shortages, for instance, within, uh, let's say, within the computer industry, which has happened, that may have, uh, may have consequences. 
Um, so <sighs> increasing the distance between your company and, and, uh, and, the, and the agents that you need to control in a, in a supply chain, you, you, may, you may actually end up with an asymmetric information problem where you don't know what causes trouble. You just see that costs are increasing. You see that perhaps quality is decreasing, quality of production. And, and you, need to, uh, you need to address that. Um, so, uh, what you, but what you, what you can see is that you, you have control over the outcome or the consequences of, of the events. Simply because that's uh, what's, uh, what's on your table when, uh, when everything has, has gone on here. You, you get you get uh, an outcome and you need to address that outcome. By perhaps doing, uh, doing uh, some kind of compens compensatory action to avoid problems. <coughs> this, is, this risk uh, thing is, a, is an excellent topic for, uh, for a master's thesis and, uh, and the like. You can there are many ways of, uh, of addressing this, uh, this risk issue. But uh, we developed um, a framework here at, the at this college. We try to, to divide uh, this into four constructs. The sources of risk, the, the drivers of, uh, of risk, uh, the sources can be connected to, uh, to weather or uh, political issues which are there and you need just to, to take them for uh, in many cases you just need to take them for given. The drivers <coughs> can, be, uh, can be connected to, uh, to uh, deficiencies in the, in the transportation network. Uh, it can be connected to, to bad <laughs> behavior in, uh, in terms of uh, diplomatic events, uh, disturb, uh, political disturbances, which uh, could have been avoided if, if one had done a better job in that respect. In any way, it has get <coughs> you get some impacts of, of this. Um, which may be uh, where it may be, may be needed to to, to address those issues and do something about them. And then you have the strategies to address the risk. You can, uh, you can, you can do some contingent actions or you can do mitigative actions. And those are different in, in, as in principle. Uh, mitigative actions could be to be proactive before the, the, the impact is actually happening. By, for instance, improving the state of the transport infrastructure, improving the control over a, over a crucial uh, link in the transport chain, and so on. It's hard to <coughs> amend bad weather, but you could do something to, to, uh, to with the risk driver as a, as a, as a, as a, that follows from bad weather. You had some flooding <coughs> during this uh, this spring in uh, in Norway, um, which uh, could perhaps have been avoided if more money had been put into uh, into. Uh, maintenance and uh, other kinds of uh, mitigative actions. Whereas contingent actions are a sort of what you might call plan B, right? Something happens, okay, if that happens, we have a plan to, to, to amend the consequences. If you have a breakdown uh, that causes uh, late deliveries, you need to do something else. 
you can uh, offer the customer another product or you can uh, you can tell them that please don't uh, be angry we'll have this these items tomorrow or you may keep inventory a higher inventory level and then we are back to this uh, this bull whip effect that we talked about last time which can which also there is a cost side connected to that of course those are examples of uh, of uh, this is an example of a I think it's useful to think about risk in these terms, sources, drivers, impacts, and then what to do about it. Be ready up front, taking uh, actions to avoid consequences, or taking actions to mitigate consequences if they happen. And then you need to sit down and calculate Calculate probabilities of things happening, calculate probabilities of customers going elsewhere if they get angry. Has to do with market power and all those kinds of things. All right, I think we break for 15 minutes.